Welcome back, everybody, to another exciting Lord Duck Band production. Behind me here is that 1974 Beetle, which, remember, we were working on uh, a couple months ago. Had a lot of engine problems. One of the big engine problems was the cylinder head on the right-hand side was loose. And you can hear that sucker banging and rattling around and just running like crap. All right, this is how it idles when it's warmed up. You see how much it's shaking? It's just something fierce. Pull this wire out. Makes no difference at all. Exhaust leak under there, you can see it. So today, we're gonna be pulling the engine out, and we're gonna have a look at it, torque that head down, as well as fix some oil leaks. So let's see how much of that we can get straightened out. So you guys know the drill. Like you like, you comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to plug the ding place. You get updates every time I upload a video. Check out DuckShit.net for all my different social media links. And I almost got distracted because Biddy down here is about to attack. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll be back right after that intro. <laughs> Well, I started getting situated back here and pull that engine out. I didn't think I needed to show that. I've showed that a million times, and I don't like pulling the and I don't like pulling out the bottom engine bolts because whenever I do that, I always hear the same crap. Why don't you use an extension? Why don't you use a swivel? Why don't you use some other kind of crap that doesn't fit by people that have never done that kind of work before? <laughs> anyway, I digress. We're off topic here. Look at how much oil is inside that bell housing. It is absolutely disgusting. And you may also notice that there's a wear pattern here on this bell housing. So from about here down, it's, the metal is kind of clean. The reason for that is because this engine had no top engine mount bolts in it. And I don't know how it was staying together. That engine mount bolt was tight, and that one was finger loose. So technically, there was only one bolt holding it in. And again, I don't know how that's even possible. Because if you just have the bottom engine bolts in, typically the engine wants to fall out. It just wants to swivel downwards. And this had no such problem that I could tell. But looking at the wear mark in the uh, bell housing here, you can see there was definitely an issue. But all that oil that's inside of there is because we have a main seal problem. I'm glad that I had him order one because I said that we're going to have that replaced. And uh, while I was poking around under here, I also noticed, look, there's the nut to the bolt that wasn't in. That D-shaped bolt that normally in there has a D-shaped head on it. Uh, that goes through the starter, missing, just gone, and the starter isn't even tight. So apparently the other bolt under there is either loose or gone. I'm going to have to investigate that also, but very, very bad. Just good we're finding this stuff now because it certainly could have been a much, much bigger problem. Anyway, at this point I have to tear down the whole engine. i got to pull everything off of it, the, the uh, cooling shroud, the carburetor, the intake manifolds, all the tins on top of it. I also have to pull out the uh, valve cover, pull out the rockers, and then we got to torque them heads down. Thankfully, the exhaust gets to stay on, at least most of it anyway. I do have to unbolt over here where it attaches to the heat riser. So I got a little bit of work ahead of me. It's kind of a lot of work because <laughs> it's a lot of little small parts and it's going to take a bit. So I'm probably just going to speed run through this. So yeah, let's go ahead. Thanks, buddy. Let's go ahead and do some kind of a time lapse on this for you guys, and uh, well, we'll be back after we have our old part. This is our troubled loose head. And guess what? It's one of the reasons why the head is loose. <laughs> yep, there is a nut off. Is the washer still in here? Well, yeah, the washer's still in place. All right, well, that's gotta go back on. <laughs> 
in this gasket here. We don't want to ruin this. It shouldn't be stuck to the head like this. It should actually be siliconed into the siliconed into the um, cover. Yeah. All right. Well. Good. We're going to. Oh wow, that was so loose. And yeah, that wasn't particularly tight either. Also loose. How are these? I bet these are tight. Yeah, those are almost always tight. That one was kind of loose. All right. That one was really loose. All right. So we're missing a bolt here, and like six out of eight bolts were loose. <laughs> well, one was off, so five out of eight were loose, and one was completely off. Okay, well, I gotta get a new torque wrench because I just remembered mine is busted. So I gotta take a pause for the cause. I'm gonna cover this all up, run to the store, and hopefully we'll be back before it gets dark. If not, we'll start this up again tomorrow. All right, we're back, everybody. Um, it rained. Clearly, you can see everything's nice and wet out here. <laughs> so I had everything put away. I had to get a brand new um, torque wrench because the old one bit the dust. The uh, ratcheting end in there blew a gear out. In addition to that, it wasn't calibrating correctly anyway. This one, however, as soon as I put it in my uh, vise and I pull a scale on the end of it, it, it calibrated just fine for the first seven foot-pounds. So, right now, I'm going to torque down the first bolts in this pattern to seven foot-pounds. And then stop. Come on. Seven. And we'll do the same right here. This is the torque spec from the Volkswagen manual. Come on. Come on, clicky clicky. There it is. Yep, that's it. This is the nut that was off. All right. And then we go. Five. Six. All good signs that everything is torquing down properly. Taking torque and that nothing's spinning around. This is just our uh, first torque spec. There's a different pattern and different spec for the next one now. Next one we set to 23 foot pounds, I think. What size are these studs? No, these are the big ones. These are 10 millimeter studs, so we're going to 23 foot pounds. And I'm gonna go inside and calibrate this again, just to be sure. 21 to 23. All right, we'll put this in device, and I'll be right back in just right. a minute. All right, we're back, and uh, it actually calibrated to 25. So it's over torquing just a little bit. So I backed it off just a couple foot pounds and recalibrated it, and yep, we got 23. Okay, now we have a new pattern, and the pattern is um, starting down here, 23 foot pounds. This is where the crisscross starts coming into play. There it is. One crisscross over to here, which is number two. I go to three. Boomer's helping me. He's under my butt right now, quacking. Yes, Boomer, you're very helpful. I see you. All right. It was kind of surprising that I didn't have to turn it that far, but this is one of them rusty nuts. I'm going to get a little rusty. Okay, I lost my pattern. Where am I? i got to go here next. Five. This one's six. And 
seven. Good. And the last one. These rusty ones always tighten up faster than the others. Okay, there we are. Everything's torqued. I can put the valves back together. Boy, do I smell some weed suddenly. Woohoo! I'll put the uh, rockers back on there. I'll get the nuts back on them. In fact, I'll do it right now while I'm yanking. Just do it, duck man. Why are you explaining it to us? You're sitting right there with everything right in front of you. Yeah, I know. That was my mistake. <laughs> Make sure all of our push rods go in the little cups like they're supposed to. Somebody is smoking some really dank stuff. Woohoo! I'm gonna get a contact high just from being out here in the yard. My god, they must be very, very close. Okay, here we go. I don't remember what the torque spec is on these. I'll look it up real quick. I think it's like 12 to 15 foot pounds or something like that. They're not too awfully tight. And then I'm not going to adjust the valves now, even though it makes sense to right now. It's kind of hard to crank the engine over with where the engine's sitting. It likes to teeter and totter and all that other crap. So when I put the engine back in the car, that's where we'll set the valves. And then we'll, uh, we'll finish it all up from there. <laughs> but before I do anything like that, I'm going to have to switch over to the other side. And just make sure the head is torqued down properly on that side too. It would be foolish not to, because we got everything apart. Assuming that, well, knowing that one side was bad, it's pretty safe to assume that the other side has issues too. Duckman, did you know? There we go. All I did was turn it until it stopped turning, and then I'll torque it from there. <laughs> mm. All right. Yeah, I think we'll have to readjust the valves anyway. They look like they're too tight now. Interesting. Funny thing is, when you take this stuff apart, things shift. It's pretty safe to uh, assume also that the head was warped when it was tightened down improperly. Or not tightened down at all in the case of it. I mean, geez, well, we had five loose bolts, one was out. So we only had a couple bolts actually holding it in. All right, we're good. I see you, Boomer. He just really wants attention. Here he is, Mr. Boom. I see you, Mr. Boom. The girl ducks, which are completely white, have been going underneath the Volkswagens out here in the yard and getting uh, Volkswagen oil all over their backs and the tops of their heads. I'm going to have to take some, uh, well, just like you see in the commercials for the oil spills, get some Dawn <laughs> or Palm Olive or Ajax. I use Ajax Orange on my hands, actually, and uh, clean them babies down, degrease them. And it just started to rain again. It is in the forecast, we know it's coming. Boomer, you're being a good boy. You really wanted daddy, didn't you? This is not normal for him to just sit here chill. Usually he'll bite or start humping or something, but he's actually just chill. Did you get something to eat today, buddy? I don't feel any food in you. I'll go make you a new bowl. <laughs> go play. Correct answer on the uh, rocker bolts here is 14 to 18. I'm saying 12 to 15. Would have worked at 15, but... Anything lesser than that would have not been good. See? And the impact didn't even over tighten them. Nice. Got a little bit of a turn on that one, about a quarter turn on there. Good. All right. I guess that rocker cover can go back on. At least for the temporary, anyway. Because we're going to find ourselves taking this back off when we do the valves later when it's back in the vehicle. See how much of this I can get done before it becomes uncomfortably rainy out here. The rain was supposed to have stopped for uh, well, pretty much all afternoon and restarted again around dinner time. I should have several hours before it rains again, and uh, well, this is Florida and you can't really predict the rain. <laughs> rain forecast what are the chances of today? The answer is yes, that's pretty much usually the way it goes. Okay. 
my 13 millimeter. Here it is. Hey, what happened here? I don't know if it's going out there, but anyway. Just gonna snug it up a little bit because, like I said, it's coming back off. There it is. All right, around to the other side. Let's see what we got. All right, starting to rain a little harder out here, so we're gonna work a little faster. All of these bolts were loose also. I didn't show that, but real quickly, I just went around them with the impact to see if they would come loose, and most of them just kind of spun without any uh, ugga dugga noises from the impact. So if they're that loose, then yeah, they weren't tight. So now we're just getting the uh, step one torque set. Get our seven foot pounds into all these. This is what pulls the head down evenly, so that way then you can do proper torque. There we go. Somebody told me once, one of my earlier videos, Duck man, you over torque them heads. Like, How am I over torquing it? And he says, Well, when it clicks, you're still turning. It's like, Well, it's because I do click, right? Until it, you know, I turn until it clicks. <laughs> so wait, you're supposed to use this. And yeah, my reaction time may not be that fast, so maybe it's an instant after it clicks that I stop turning. But I'm sure the amount uh, of difference is very, very marginal. So, yeah, I don't need to listen to stuff like that. One nonsense person. Everybody else is always on my page, but yeah, that one. You never can tell with some people, I'll tell you what. It's 23 foot-pounds for our second stage. Why are we not clicking? Yeah, we are set to 23. Should have clicked by now, I would have thought. Oh, there it is. Yep. All right, number two is this one. There it is. Like everything getting all wet while I'm working here, but a little bit of dampness isn't such a big deal. A little burn off when the engine heats up, as long as this engine doesn't get full of water, which we're not going to allow it to do. There we go down here, and then the upper left corner. There it is. Yep, confirmed. Yeah, that's it. All right, we are effectively torqued. Let's put our rockers back on, and I'm gonna cover everything back up because I don't need to be working in this rain. This engine doesn't need to be getting wet, if you know what I mean, Vern. Washers on there. Make sure our push rods are on where they belong. They are. All right, good. Rain's slowing down a little bit, but I'm still going to cover everything. Pouring off the roof, which is right behind me, and if it gets any harder, it's gonna spray me. All right, there we go. And that should be set to 18 foot pounds. Again, I'm uh, rather impressed with this torque wrench. When I calibrate it on the bench, it uh, shows the right values. It's really, really close. Could also be a little discrepancy in my scale. Yes can't necessarily blame this tool for all of it. All right, 18 foot-pounds, here we go. That was looser than I thought it was. All 
All right, good. One valve cover go back on. And we'll adjust the valves. We get it back in the car. Thread in. I have to check. There might be a booger on it. A damn booger. Ew, a booger. <laughs> Alright, slide this up. Just for the time being. Use an impact so I break off them motherfucker bolts. Yeah, everybody loves to see that. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna have to check the oil cooler up there. Because all this gumminess on top of the engine and how much oil there is on top of there, it's just something's leaking and the only thing that could put oil on top of that engine is going to be that oil cooler. So we're going to change out all the donuts on it. And somewhere I have a pressure tester for the oil cooler too so I can see if the oil cooler itself is pissing out. Because it might be. Although it doesn't look like it, the oil cooler itself looks pretty clean. It looks like it's all wet along the seams. So we'll change out all the gogies on that stuff and we'll solve that problem. Alright, time to clean that oil cooler well I should say I've already cleaned it look how grody it still is this engine was so dirty and I'll show you that in just a minute it took me all day to clean it yesterday I used two cans two cans two clans <laughs> let's not get involved with uh, removing boil um, nonetheless I used two cans of oven cleaner and one can of degreaser and I scrubbed that thing and I put it through six cycles of washing until finally I've got it clean enough that I can handle it without getting too dirty but you can see there's still some spots that I've missed so we'll clean that up too but these little gogies here are what's leaking and these are under pressure on a Volkswagen typically this is a place you don't want to have an oil leak because it will gush and that's the reason why the top of that engine was so dirty and these little gogies here are kind of beat up too Probably from all that pressure and heat. I mean, they're hard as a rock. There's no doubt they were leaking because all the oil, like I said, was over the top of the engine. The only place the oil can leak from over the top of the engine is from the oil cooler. Now, that is a 90 degree adapter. This is actually an OEM. Now, Volkswagen used to have the oil cooler here. They decided to move it over to there. Rather than change the design of the case, they just made an adapter to go on the top of it. I like that kind of engineering because that's the way I would have done it. But we're going to remove the oil cooler from the adapter. He's just our little 10 millimeters. And there's going to be two rubber gogies behind this also. I hate when those nuts get stuck in there. There we go. And of course, Biddy's going to scream. Alright, there they are. Now we can take these out of here. Shake the washers off, which don't want to come off. That's just as well. There it is. There's the two rubber gogies in there. This oil cooler doesn't look like it itself was leaking, which is good because it's all clean up through here. I don't see any gummy oil or nonsense, especially up on the inside in there, so that looks clean. So I'll give this a bit of a bath just to make sure that's good. Clean this off as well. And these little gogies that are in here, we're going to replace with new ones. Kind of like how that one's glued in there pretty good. These actually look to be in better shape than the ones that were underneath the adapter. Wait, they're in there pretty good. Okay. I'm going to have to get a screwdriver or something. Jeez, I wonder if I can get it out with a, with a razor. Nope. Boy, they're hard as a rock. They are hard as a rock. There's one. Hard as a rock and flat as a pancake. That sucker is nice and crushed. Oh, my. Razor would ordinarily cut into these things. These things have turned into diamonds. They've been under so much pressure and heat. There it is. All right, we're going to clean that up real quick. I'll let that sit with a little more oven cleaner on it for about 10 minutes. We'll hose it off, and that should be good to go. And then we'll reseal this thing up, and we'll put it back on the engine. And these are the little rubber gogies we're going to use to replace. These are the ones you would find on an earlier oil cleaner. These are the ones you'd find on an earlier oil cooler that don't have the 90-degree uh, offset. Sometimes you can't get these to seal, and these are the Type 3 ones. And uh, I have found that I can put a Type 3 one in place of this one and it will seal up a whole lot better because these have a tendency to mushroom out. These, I don't like these. These kind of suck. And you know what sucks more than these? Baby screaming when I'm trying to make a video. <laughs> Alright. 
I could have got a little cleaner, I suppose, if I put it in the parts washer, but I don't have that much time for that. The owner wants this thing back. And this stuff isn't on the ceiling surfaces, it's just kind of like, kind of like a black crustiness. Yeah, it's not coming off too easily. Well, I'm not going to put too awfully much time into that because it's not on the cooling surfaces. Looking through here though, through the harmonica, you can actually see light through it. There's no paste or buildup or crust or anything. One of the reasons why I didn't think this oil cooler itself was leaking. It looked like it was all in the uh, rubber gogies. So there's our gogies, just like so. And we take our adapter, which is still a little wet. <laughs> Put that right in there, just like so. Uh-oh. My donut fell out. Get back in there, Gogi. All right, good. All right, see that? And then one on the other side, good. I don't remember what the torque spec is on this. I'm gonna have to look it up. But first I'm gonna wind it down with an impact because I like to strip out the bolts. <laughs> Somebody in one of my videos earlier this week said to me that I make up this stuff that I, whenever I talk about other people saying things to me because he never sees any of this stuff down in the comments. Well, it's like, it's not every video, dude. You make up stuff just for attention. You know, you are an attention whore. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute now. You just became exactly the guy I was talking about in all my videos that makes these stupid comments all the time. <laughs> Incredible, the audacity of some people to become exactly what I was talking about. For no reason. You know, I offer these videos for free. It's not like I'm billing you for them. If I bill you for these things and I'm providing you an inadequate service, you can hate on me all you want. But you know what? If you just don't like me because you just don't like me, fuck off. <laughs> and I'm sure you agree. Anyway, enough about other people. I'm going to come back and torque that down properly. We're going to put our gogies on here. And then this drops down on top of the engine case which I've already cleaned that up also. I'll show you that in just a minute. But that, I had oven cleaner on, like I said, six times. I put it through six different washes until finally I got it to the point where I could touch the engine case and my hand is clean, which most Volkswagens, you can't do that. <laughs> but it was about a quarter inch of crud on that thing, so. And this is our flywheel gogi. I thought we ordered a separate one. I didn't realize there was gonna be one on the seal kit. So I'm gonna leave that out just in case. But I gotta figure out where I put the other seals that I have here, because I have the crank seal. We're going to do that also in this video. All right, well, let's get this torqued down and put back on that engine. All right. There's our rubber gogies. Right on here, just like this. Got this bolts on like that. Two of these bolts are up underneath here, really hard to get to. And the one is on top, which is really easy to get to. So these are the ones you always get under here and you drop the fucking washers. <laughs> and you get them started on the threads. An obnoxious design, but I guess it kind of had to be that way. I would have preferred a bolt flange more like this over here, but have it come upwards would have made more sense. But I didn't design these things. I wasn't working with Porsche in his offices when they were drawing on the... Uh, Whiteboard, if they had a whiteboard, probably chalkboard. <laughs> All right, get these up under here. Ah, I got them on the first try without dropping any. Yeah, I did all that bitching and moaning, and I managed to do it without screwing it up. These bolts, by the way, are uh, five foot pounds, is all. And since you can't really get a torque wrench up underneath here, you're kind of going to guess it. And the idea with these is, is make them snug, but don't crank them because you're gonna crush those washers if you do. I should say the gogies. Little rubber gogies will get smashed. You don't wanna crush them to the point that they're no good anymore. Five foot pounds is all you need and it, five foot pounds is not much. Why am I turning that to the left? Because Duckman, you're a loser. Because I'm visualizing the bolts I have to turn backwards on the other side over here. <laughs> Snug for the moment, and we'll come back and tighten them down more. I'm glad everything is clean, man. I mean, my hands are not filthy like they would have been. You see, this case is kind of a dull gray color because I got the majority of the grease off of it. If 
Five foot pounds, by the way, you guys, is not much. That's probably about five right there. All right. I mean, that's just, like I said, fingertip tighten. Right there, five. And then cinch it up, five. Good. Our oil cooler is now ready to start oil cooling. All right, good. That means our shroud can go back on. We got to get to the other side over here. We got to change out that flywheel seal. The main seal and the uh, rubber gogi that's inside the flywheel are also leaking. One of the two, or maybe both. But these are the two worst oil leaks you could have on an air-cooled Volkswagen engine because these are the ones that are under pressure. Under pressure. All right, we can start reassembling some of these tins. This one. The right one, right? Yeah, three four. Should have put it on after putting on the elbow, the 90 degree uh, oil cooler. You can get it under it, but it's tricky to say the least. Get under there. There it goes. Good. Very nice. Coming together. The one that goes on this side. This one goes on a lot easier. There it is. So we had a beautiful day yesterday, and here it's getting ready to rain again. <laughs> anyway, I did notice down here on this exhaust, these are the heat riser uh, flanges. They've not been drilled. This is an aftermarket exhaust pipe on here, so whoever installed it didn't drill these out. And that's important because this one does run a stock carb that does use stock heat risers. So we'll get that set up correctly and make sure that works because without a carburetor preheater, these things have a tendency to run finicky. Sometimes rich, sometimes lean because a cold intake manifold will cause fuel to puddle up inside of it. And then when you get puddled up fuel to run into the cylinder, well, it runs rich. So we'll get that fixed, get that set up like it's supposed to be. And otherwise, we're in a good spot right now. I'm gonna start wrapping some stuff up because like I said, it's gonna rain. Let's get everything covered up nicely. I'll push the engine back underneath the car and I'll close the lid to try to keep it as dry as possible. That cover is fantastic, by the way. When it gets wet, it gets heavy with the wet and uh, the wind doesn't blow it off. So I'll put that over it shove it under there should be good to go nice and safe until uh, the next clearing and the weather and then we can take the next steps to get this thing finished up but we're almost there I've gotta gotta do that flywheel seal and then we can actually do the proper reinstall of all the rest of the components yeah we're back on again off again rain for three days was pretty miserable anyway we got everything covered up on this we got it degreased for the most part it's pretty well stained or I guess it's still just a little damp what we need to do is we need to pull off the clutch and flywheel right here, held down by six bolts the whole way around, 13 millimeters. And we're gonna get in there and remove the flywheel completely, replace the O-ring and the seal, our main seal. Can't call it a rear main seal because technically it's a front main seal because front is front, faces that way, right? So we'll get in there and we'll change that seal out because that's the source of our second most worst, second most worst, most this worst this is. <laughs> Where's this worst yeah, the clutch is removed and it looks like for the most part it's dry and that means the o-ring on the inside of the uh, seal that means the o-ring inside of the flywheel here is probably pretty good I bet you it's the seal on the outside that's got the damage we'll know more of course once we get that apart now we have to remove the gland nut and I've got a special tool for that look at this it's assembled backwards but we'll fix that pull that pin out reverse it but this allows me to multiply the torque to be able to loosen that gland nut which is tightened to, uh, I forget what it is, like 300 foot-pounds. It's a lot. Don't try to do this with a breaker bar. I mean, you can, I guess. I know a lot of people that have, but it's kind of the BS way. This tool simplifies everything because you can do it with just a little ratchet or just a box-end wrench. And it amplifies your torque 10 to 1. This is, this tool is the only right way to tighten one of these. It's also the only easy way well not the easy way I mean you could remove this with a uh, with an impact if you wanted to 
And yeah, it would be a lot faster. It would probably save me about, I don't know, 60 seconds, maybe two minutes. If I was mass producing these, removing a ton of flywheels, I would say that probably I would use an impact to remove these, but never, never, never an impact to tighten them. The reason why is because you don't know how tight your impact is gonna make it. Maybe it doesn't tighten all the way. Maybe it tightens it too much. It's kind of hard to tighten them too much, although I think this one was on here too tight. That required a little more force than they usually do. And the flywheel should pull out of here, just like this, rock it back and forth. I see it coming out. This is a lightened flywheel, by the way. I'm gonna put it up on the bench and I'm gonna show you guys how I know that. Come on, a little bit more. And it's out. And there's our shitty seal. And yeah, it is covered in oil. Looking pretty bad. All right, we're gonna replace that for sure. All right, there's our flywheel. If you notice this side, you can see all the oil streaks coming out of it. This is the side for sure where this seal was leaking on. And this seal, by the way, just kind of came out of the crankcase. In fact, it doesn't even fit very tight on there. That's not a very good seal at all. And if you look right there, you can see it's a little just deformed. Being deformed is not good in the case of seals. And this thing, I actually, I just hooked my finger behind it and it kind of came out of the case, so it wasn't even fitting in the case properly. It also looks like somebody put some kind of a sealer on it. See all that gray stuff that's on there? Not supposed to be on there, so I'm gonna have to check that case and make sure it's good and clean. Otherwise, pressure plate looks good. It's not greasy on this side. It is a little greasy on the ends, but again, this thing was slinging all the oil off, but not slinging it from the inside on the clutch side. This clutch still looks like it's new. In fact, you can see it's shiny in the wear patterns, but close to the rivet holes, it's barely even scuffed. So this clutch is probably close to new. Yeah, it's got hardly any wear on it. I mean, it's still really thick. This is, a, this is definitely something to reuse. Otherwise, let's have a look at the other side of the flywheel. The inside should be out. Wait a minute, hang on. Inside here is our rubber gogi. I don't know why I turned it over looking for it. It's right here. This guy, you see this? And this could have been leaking too. But usually if this one leaks and it leaks through the center and comes out that side and leaks into the clutch. But this little rubber gogi here uh, we're going to replace it anyway, whether or not it needs it. And we're also going to put a little bit of Forma gasket on the inside of that lip. And I wouldn't ordinarily, I should say, you shouldn't, ordinarily, you shouldn't ordinarily need that. But in the case of these, I put in some new ones before, put everything together, get the engine mounted, start it up, it still leaks. You know how big of a pain in the ass it is to pull it all back out, only to replace the gasket again? So from now on, every time I put one of these in, I just get in there, a little Forma gasket in there, Put the uh, seal in, clean it, reassemble it. They've never leaked on me again. This one is uh, kind of brittle. Yeah, it's kind of brittle. In fact, it is broken right there. That may or may not have been for me though. What happened? You get attacked? Did you get attacked? You got attacked by your auntie, Aunt Fluffy. Did you attack Pecan? Did you? <laughs> Chicken drama. <laughs> anyway, that might have been for me. But you know, looking at it, it's dinged in two spots. And that's not for me. If it was dinged in one spot, it's for me. It's also dinged there. Now, this might have been a bad rubber gogi to begin with. So anyway, getting replaced. All this is going to get degreased. We're going to clean the whole thing down. This is a lightened flywheel. I think I mentioned that earlier. How you tell? See this stepped area in here? A stock flywheel would normally have this built out. Where my finger is, this would all be metal. And that removes about two pounds of metal from it. And lines up the flywheel considerably. It's actually a nice upgrade even on a stock engine, although some people will tell me some crazy shit about that. One guy in the past told me that the flywheel will spin faster than the crank. Now, I don't know how that's possible unless the flywheel makes its own energy. Now, if you know anything about free energy, the science behind the physics and all that stuff, free energy doesn't exist, or at least it's not been proven yet. So if the flywheel is spinning faster than the engine, and that means the engine's making gasoline and every peri periodically you're gonna have to pull over just to drain your gas tank because you have too much gas in there. <laughs> That's the kind of logic that person was telling me. So anyway, no, they don't spin faster than the crank and they're not gonna shear off the dowel pins because that's just not the way it works. <laughs> it's impossible for it to spin faster. It's just, yeah, it's not going to unless it makes energy of its own. Anyway, I'm cleaning out this lip in here. 
and sometimes some crud will build up in there. And I had this happen on Ruby once, the first time I ever experienced it, but I wiped it out and I didn't get it completely, and I left the lump on one side and the engine had a shake. You could actually feel it. It was enough you could feel it, at idle especially, when you grabbed it up, not so much, but at idle, the engine would shake. That little bit made a huge difference. So I'll get in there with some brake cleaner, clean this whole thing out. And I might even scuff it up with a little bit of emery to make the clutch grip a little bit better. And I like to do the same with this here too. Usually when I install a new flywheel or pressure plate, I throw these into my blasting cabinet and I sandblast these edges so that way they're nice and scuffed up, ready to accept a new clutch. All right, let's get cleaning this stuff up. We'll get our new rubber gogi, we'll get our new seal. We'll start putting things back in. All right, everything is degreased. Trying to open this up here. Stuff has such a weird smell. Just get in here and just sear it in that lip. You don't need a lot. Kind of made a mess. <laughs> Oops. I'll clean it up. And then this O-ring just kind of tucks into that groove. And that former gasket kind of glues it in. It gives the leak no path of escape. Okay. Now we're going to bolt this back on. Well, we got to replace the seal yet in the case too. But then we'll bolt it back on. And then we'll check the end play. Anybody's guess what the end play is going to look like on here. Here we go. Good to go. All right, rocking and rolling. And here's that old seal and here's the new one. Just looking down the inside of this, I can see that the old seal has a, a larger inside diameter. I don't know why that is for any reason other than it's probably just beat up. But anyway, yeah, that fits good and tight over that flywheel. I can feel it stretch versus this one. This one just kind of drops right on. Like a hot dog down a hallway. This one actually has a, yeah, oh, it's like a first time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, that's gotta go in the engine case. What I do before I put it in the case is I put a little oil all the way around it, just rub it on with your finger, and then drive it into the case. And I have a tool for that, too. When you're driving this into the case, this is the tool that I use. I like to just lay it on there and gently tap it with a hammer. Now, some people like to tell me and they're right. You can just drive it in with the gland nut and push it in that way. But I've discovered that using this tool for some reason, it doesn't reach the threads. So that's not gonna work. I imagine I could probably turn it around backwards and maybe it would. But that's also, it's gonna chew up the tool because this is just lightweight aluminum. So just some gentle tapping with a rubber mallet all the way around, it goes right in. Anyway, all the tools you see in this video, there's links down below in the video description if you need some of them. They're pretty easy to get. They're not too awfully expensive. You know, well, except for maybe the, uh, the Glenn nut uh, torque multiplier. It's also good on your rear brakes, by the way. So if you have a Volkswagen and do work on it, I do recommend it. This is all printed in German. That's interesting. Dice Scheiße zum Dickring. Just what I want, a Scheiße Dickring. All right, anyway. <laughs> Let's go ahead and put that seal in. This is a little trick that comes from uh, Gary over at VW Jawbreaker. Subscribe! Links down below in the video description. You can find where the seams are in this little thing here. And you can actually... What are you ducks doing? You can unscrew them. And then what you can do... Is you can stretch this back and cut it. Just a little bit out of it. And my cutter's not here, of course. What are you ducks eating? Can't leave the ducks alone for a minute. You just don't know what they're going to start eating. Anyway, I got that stretched back a little bit. And then the idea is to cut this off. And you're probably saying, hey, why are you doing that? That's because Gary on VW Jawbreaker did it, so it's good for me too. But anyway, it allows you to uh, cut this back. And you can still screw it back in. And now that this ring is smaller, what that's going to do is squeeze the seal a little tighter on that flywheel which will give you a better seal so thanks to Gary of VW Trailbreaker for that little trick and here it is alright all oiled up ready to go back in that case
All right, we got that seal driven in. You typically just want it flush with the case, so flush to the surface, just like that. That gets it. That's a four dowel crank. This is an eight dowel flywheel. You gotta get them lined up. Typically, um, I don't know why they do it, but they will misalign one of the um, dowels on purpose. So it only goes in one way. I don't know why they do it exactly, but they do it. So I'm gonna need two hands for this. It doesn't want to see. Oh, there it goes. Never mind. Never mind. Okay. Now I can put our gland nut back in. Just like that. Okay. And I got a socket here. Get that started. I'm gonna get this torque down and we're gonna check our end play on the end here. All right, this is me checking the end play for the second time after I uh, pulled the shims out. There was two shims in here, they need to be at least three. The reason for that is, is because oil gets in between those layers and there are a bunch of washers that spin against themselves. If you have two, they'll wear excessively. If you have three, it wears per the uh, design. You could even do four. You could even do five if you had to, but I think if you're hitting the a uh, case of five shims, you probably have an awful lot of crank wear. Ruby is currently running four because uh, I had to add one super thin one the last time I had the flywheel seal out. Anyway, it had two shims. Uh, they were really thick ones. I put three really thin ones in. I don't know what the measurements were. They were just random ones in my toolbox. Stacked them up, put them in, and to my surprise, we're exactly at three one thousandths. And we need to be between three and five one thousandths. You want to be on a smaller number if you can. It gives you more room for wear. But anyway, currently set to zero. Get right about zero, pull this back, let go, and well, it was at three. It's about zero, zero, three, five thousandths, or ten thousandths, if you will, 35 ten thousandths. So it's within spec. We're good. I was really concerned with that as soon as I saw it. It had no end play at all. I don't know how this crank wasn't locking up. I hope you guys could see that well enough on the dial there. But anyway, we should be in good shape. I'm gonna call this good. We can start putting our flywheel back together. The clutch, the pressure plate, all that stuff can go back in. And then we can put the rest of this engine together and put it back in the car. All right. Ready to crank on the gland nut here. I've already started to turn it with a ratchet. Uh, I got things started down here. Here's my flywheel stop. This stops the flywheel from turning. I don't usually use that, but because I'm working kind of a precarious angle here, it's much harder for me to turn it. Got an 11 millimeter socket onto a torque wrench. I'm currently torquing this down. Oh, there it is, we're already at spec. So it doesn't really need any more. And usually on these gland nuts, it's, it's better to have them on the arrow of a little too tight rather than too loose. If they're too tight, they typically don't strip. What'll happen is the nut will explode. <laughs> and then you'll have to replace the nut. Uh, I can't say I've ever heard of one stripping out unless somebody cross-threaded or something, but you kind of know if it's cross-threaded. So anyway, that's on there. We're good. Moving on to the next step, which is put that clutch back on. This is my clutch pilot tool. It actually is just an input shaft from a transmission. You might notice it looks very familiar. This holds the clutch centered, clutch disc, so you can tighten down the pressure plate. You don't have to have one. I recommend you do, because otherwise, when it comes time to put that engine in, if that's out of alignment, you'll have a hell of a time getting the clutch over the input shaft. <laughs> It'll take a lot of banging it around and cursing and swearing. Eventually you'll get it in there, but it'll be quite a battle. Definitely don't recommend it. There's still a puddle of water in there for when uh, I clean out this bell housing. It did rain since though, so that might be what got in there. Anyway, dry now. Look at that. Good. Okay. Good, good. If this deck lid weren't on, I could actually put the engine in as is, and then I could uh, drop the shroud on top of it after that, but we're going to put the shroud on it first. All right, we got the heat riser holes drilled, which were not on this pipe when it was new. So they're opened up now. I couldn't open them much more than that because the tubes underneath are just tiny little bitty things. So yeah, that hole is not something you could open up. If I opened it up to that size, the flange would have fell off. Not good. <laughs> anyway, we also put some new intake manifold gaskets on, so we're ready to drop the whole uh, intake manifold back on there. New one on that side too. Ready to go. All right, 
On she goes. All right, there's our manifold. All bolted down. Got a lot of the tin screwed down. I got a new breastplate here, which is what this car was missing. I had one of my pile of junk, so we're gonna put that on there too. And clean off a little bit of those rust spots and put a little touch-up spray paint on here and there. I gotta put this piece back on, which has a little damage to it, but we'll get it straight and put it back in there. Well, we got everything apart. Also, I'm gonna adjust that clutch cable. The problem was it's kind of frozen, and it was I was unable to get to it before. Uh, I couldn't get my hands in there to really muscle it. But now it's kind of exposed. You can see the wing nut to it there. So it'll be real easy to get to from the engine compartment. Mr. Boomer's over here helping me. He stole my 32 millimeter or 36 millimeter socket. Right? And what's on your face? You got a mustache? What is that all about? <laughs> That's it, trying to do a hit Hitler thing there. Yeah, I see you. you got him over here. Pecan's following me around. What? I put your food there. That way you can come eat and sit by me. You're such a chicken shit. There's Mama Bird. Minding her business. She's so big. Even though she's kind of skinny, she's not been eating well. I don't know what her trouble is so much, but she's just not eating well. She comes and goes in spurts like that. She'll get fat, she'll get skinny. She'll get fat, she'll get skinny. Like most American women, you know. And then over there is Frosty, who kind of is like her grandmother. Fat, skinny, fat, skinny. Oh, here's Cheeky. What are you doing, Cheeky? Cheeky's like perpetually fat. <laughs> she just stays fat, but Cheeky eats what I eat. So the duck man's fat because Cheeky's fat. We eat the same stuff. Look what I got, Cheeky. You want this? You want daddy's drink? Come here. Come on. Go on it. Yeah, I see. Boomer here is distracting you. I'll come to you. I'll come to you. Hope your beak isn't too dirty. I put it in my drink. Come here. Come on. Go ahead. Have some bourbon with daddy. Go ahead. Have some. There you go. Do it. I know, Boomer's distracting you. It's all right, get in there. I'm only gonna give you one chance. There you go, you want it? Get it. There you go, good girl. Nope, shook that one out, didn't like it, huh? Yeah, I know, that's that new uh, spiced Coke crap. I like it plain, I don't like it with bourbon in it, but too late, I mixed it, I'm drinking it. <laughs> all right, shroud and alternator are on. I gotta bolt them down yet, but they're there. Right, Boomer? You've been helping me the whole while, biting my ankles while I'm trying to work. <laughs> anyway, first thing I know is looking at it, look at all the spots on the front of it. This has been the year for pollen. More pollen this year than I've ever seen around here. And this is funny, despite not having trees anymore, because we cut them all down, now I have more pollen than ever. And it's pine tree pollen. It's that greenish uh, yellow crap that gets all over everything this time of year. And yeah, it comes from the pines. But anyway, this engine's going back together pretty quickly. I've not run into any more problems during uh, assembly here. We were missing a couple pieces. Those pieces of tin right there, Wild Bill had uh, what we needed to save the day. It was the stuff for the oil cooler back here. The oil coolers used to live inside the shroud. Later models, they moved it to the outside of the shroud and they put this triangular piece on here and a little chute that goes through that hole. This is normally up here like this and allows the heat to go out onto the car. So all that oil cooler heat doesn't get recycled in the engine compartment. The last thing you want is all that extra heat to go back in there and you know, it's just gonna stack heat as they say. Just keep making everything hotter. Yes, Boomer, I see you. I don't know if you guys can see the color on his wings here. He's getting this beautiful purple green colors on his wingtips. Something that uh, mallards have, and he's a mallard. He's a domesticated mallard, but he's a mallard. You see that beautiful colors here. I don't know if the camera picks it up at all, but it's on his wing. Ever since he started getting laid with his two girlfriends, he started growing colors. Yeah, he just want to play now. Now he wants to play. He wants to play. I had no idea you wanted to play, buddy. We just missed his birthday. We didn't talk about it on the internet. He just turned eight years old. Eight years old. Life expectancy for a duck is typically like seven to 10. In the wild, less than that. He's domesticated. I take care of him. You know, he eats nice food. He gets to sit in climate control at night, sleep comfortably, he doesn't have to worry about predators. I mean, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't live way past 10. I mean, Skeeter did. Skeeter made it to uh, almost 18 years old. I see you, buddy. But you're a chicken. Chickens die sooner. And I'm sorry to say that. I love you very much. But yeah, it's true. Good boy. Good boy. <laughs> All right. Go play with your girlfriends. Look, your girlfriends are over there. Go play with them. So, Duckman, just why do you like Volkswagen so much? And the honest answer is it's because the Volkswagen engineers just thought of everything. 
Blue cup for the win. Hey, last <laughs> night while it was pitch black, I stabbed the engine in, and I turned the key once, and it fired up immediately. The carburetor was still full of gas, so I had that in my favor. <laughs> I had some trouble adjusting the belt. I don't know what the problem was on that, but it, it seems to be good after everything's said and done. Um, I had a feeling that the pulley just wasn't seating properly in there, but anyway, now it is. Hi, Biddy. What are you up to there, buddy? We've got the rear apron over here. Here it is. And I've started adding flanges to the sides of these here because the flanges, the existing ones, were kind of in bad shape. They were just really rusted and full of holes and all the uh, drilling that they did in there. Now, I could have welded this on if I wanted to, but being the metal is so thin and it's already been compromised, there's really not much left. Panel bond was probably the best option. And we used some stainless steel strips on there so we don't have to worry about rust anymore. You know what the plan is, if you probably noticed looking over here, we've got these gaps spread up between the fenders and the rear quarter panel. So right in between here, that apron should slip in here, and then using the two bolts that are naturally in here, it should clamp everything together. So what we'll do is we'll drill a couple of holes through here where they're supposed to go, and we'll fit it all together on here. It should be no problem after that. The third bolt is removed from up here, just to give the fender enough flex to be able to pull it out, because if I left that one in there, this fender <laughs> wouldn't move at all. So we did the same on both sides. So we're waiting for the panel bond to dry, or harden, I should say. It takes about 24 hours. It's been sitting for a few hours now, so tomorrow in the morning, we should be able to come out here and put this thing together. Right, Shitty Bitty? Yeah, as soon as I come talking out here, you come come harass me. Everybody's around me, too. Mr. Boom is, like, in a really loving mood today. He's acting very weird. Hope you're not sick, Mr. Boom. Anyway, uh, I've got to work on the valve covers next, because when we started the engine, if you look at that, uh, you don't know if you can even see it. Yeah, you can, right there on the plywood. There's a wet spot there and a wet spot there, which denotes that the valve covers are leaking. However, there's no oil spots in the middle of the engine, although the engine do, does still have a bit of a an oil slick on the bottom of it, so it needs to be um, further degreased and cleaned up underneath. Thank you, Biddy. I'm glad you're helping me here. Oh, he wants to fight. Okay, we're not going to mess with him. But anyway, valve covers seem to be addressed, and then those sled tins, if you look in there, you can see that they're all goofy, too. It looks like the screws have pulled out of them where they attach to the case, so I'll straighten all that stuff out. But anyway, I'm doing a lot of this, and not enough of this. So let's get in here and take care of this stuff. First, we'll start with those valve cover gaskets. And you, I need to make you go away, because if you're around while I'm under there, you're going to attack me. Yeah, he's pretending like he's eating now. Just pretending, but as soon as I get close, yeah, see? <laughs> just pretending that he's being good. He's just pretending. All right, go play somewhere. <laughs> All right, there's our leaky valve cover. There's the gasket, which is, well, it's nice and crispy. Yeah, it's nice and hard. That's what happens to him over time. It's also crushed, it's really flat, as opposed to the new ones here, which are very supple and kind of fluffy. And that's her name, Fluffy. <laughs> I heard her squeak while I was recording, too. How you doing, Fluffy? Ah! Anyway, this uh, one goes in the trash. So we're going to put the new one on. And the way to get these suckers sealed is just with um, some axle grease. So any kind of wheel bearing grease or what have you, the red stuff here is what we're going to use. It works just fine. You can use marine grease also, what I recommend you do. Just get around here and uh, clean off the flange on both the head and on the cover. Because if there's any dirt or debris in here, it's going to affect how well it seals up. And when you put that grease on these seals, you don't put a whole lot on. Just, you know, with your thumb, just smear a thin layer all the way around it. What it does, ooh, these fits in there real good. What it does is it fills in all the pores in the, the cork. Because if you put this on directly, it's probably just gonna leak. And this was covered in a very, very short blurb inside the instruction manual. Otherwise, I never would have known it because there's almost no chatter about it online. That's one of those things I learned some time ago. And like I said, short blurb. I mean, it's not even a full sentence. It's just like a little like coat with axle grease kind of thing. <laughs> So anyway, we'll get that seated in there. I'll clean off the, uh, the flange on the head also, and then we'll grease it up on both sides and install it. Now, some people like to use a high temperature RTV, put it on here and then seal up the one side with this. It also makes it easier when you take it apart that the uh, gasket will seal to the, the um, cover. And in this case, we're not gonna do it because it didn't come apart that way. And frankly, I don't have any RTV right now and I wanna get this video out in a hurry. So we're just gonna seal this up per the manual 
using some That's grease. it. Both sides of that cork gasket are greased up. This is ready to go back on the car. Now, once again, I'll repeat, before it goes back in the car, wipe down that flange on that head. Make sure there's nothing stuck to it, because otherwise, it's going to leak. <laughs> otherwise, this goes right, right on. We're going right to do now. us a cold start. Hey, not hot. Not in the least. We'll fire it up. This thing starts up so easily. It's ridiculous. Turn the key. That's it. Don't have to pump the throttle or nothing. Also helps that it has a choke on it. Whereas like my Delordos on my uh, Ruby do not. A little shaky, but it's cold. All that goes away once it warms up. And we're gonna look underneath for uh, valve cover leaks. Before when it was idling, it would just start dripping out. And I don't think it's gonna be an issue anymore. So we'll let it run a minute, and uh, we'll be right back. Boy, this sounds so much better. No more heads rattling. You used to be able to see exhaust come out from under there. Not anymore. Fixed. This thing's going to drive so much better. All right, I ran it a bit. Revved it up real high, because that's one of the ways that it would make an oil stain, is you had to rev it, because that oil pressure had to go up, which went through the um, oil cooler and would blow out the uh, main seal. So, no longer an issue. Here it is. Everything's dry underneath it except for a couple of water spots because I did finish just degreasing the bottom of the engine because when I started up, it did drip. And that's because oil gets warm. And what does it do when it gets warm? It flows. So that's exactly what happened. Anyway, I degreased the engine, put the piece of wood back underneath there. It's just a couple of water drops, but this thing runs so good. It's incredible how easily it starts. That's, <laughs> that's what I gotta say. But anyway, we'll wait till tomorrow morning when this thing should finish curing. Then we'll cut our little holes where the bolts are gonna go through and we'll get it mounted on there and then uh, we'll wrap up the video. But not too much left on this thing. This, uh, this car is coming along. Removable apron time. Here it is, cured overnight. That panel bond got nice and rock hard. There's some boogers sticking out in here. It needs a little bit of sanding, because otherwise, if you put the boogers in the seam here, it's going to cause that to be wider than it needs to be. There's also a booger there. So a little bit of sanding on that will take care of it. Here, the clamps are still on this side. I'll pull these off real quick. They don't need to be here anymore. This side, I went a little overzealous with the panel bond. Whoa, there you go. Good example. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to free that up. But anyway, I put a little more on there than I would have, and when I squeezed it, it oozed out. So I got a little more sanding work to do on this side. The good news is panel bond actually does sand down pretty easily. It's not too bad as far as that's concerned. It's like sanding plastic. So that's it. We'll get the boogers off of this side too, but we're gonna have to get yeah, him out of there because he's panel bonding himself on. <laughs> anyway, I wanna try this thing out and see how it fits without doing any cutting or even booger sanding. I just wanna shove it in there and see what we got. Well, this sucker's ready to go. Um, did a lot of things off camera because I was kind of a hurry to get it done. He wants to drive it home. They have two cars in their family and they've been sharing a car. It's a real pain in the ass, so he wanted this one back. Well, anyway, I shoved a, a bus seal in there temporarily. So I don't know what he's got for a seal for the rear apron because I noticed it didn't have one. But uh, yeah, the apron was removed. I was able to reinstall it using stock bolts by just adding stainless steel flanges to the sides of it using a little bit of panel bond, and I'm gonna use the same method to install an Eleanor. That seems to make a lot of sense to me. No pins, no locks, no latches, no additional crap. Everything that's here is just factory bolts. You know what I mean? Just take the bolts out, apron comes out. Makes a lot of sense. Anyway, we're good in that department. I also fixed the speedometer. It wasn't working. I replaced the speedometer cable. I replaced all the little rubber gogies that are on it. Got all that working in there, so that's working real wonderfully. I replaced the sway bar uh, bushings and the clamps up underneath the front. And the funny thing was, we thought it was the uh, <laughs> the rubbers and the clamps that quit. But when I got a good look at it, I discovered the sway bar actually broke into two pieces. I haven't seen that happen before, but I guess it does happen, and there it is. It happened right here on this vehicle. So thankfully, I had another sway bar, and it was actually right next to where I was working on this one. I had one I pulled off of something some time ago. I didn't need it, so I gave it to him. He can have it. I installed that using his new clamps, and uh, well, now it's properly working. So we're good to go in that department. Um, he should be here in a little while to come get it, and out it should go. And then shortly after, this bus will be going too. I talked to the owner about this. He actually stopped by and dropped off those new mirrors that you see here. 
as we had problems with uh, hinge pins and these doors were falling down and off camera I didn't show that either but I did some door adjustments I actually had to bend the door hinges a little bit so that way the doors weren't so saggy so they closed straight and this one see closes properly now before they just kind of bounce back open I'm way off topic from this beetle video but you guys always want to know these things so there it is and closes right up before it would just bounce back open and the door would hang down kind of low with no more hang low now it does what it's supposed to do and it's got the big elephant ear mirrors some people like those some people don't but they certainly work for visibility the one thing that they do really well is give you a large picture of what's going on behind you this thing still needs to be fixed looks like he's a little chip in the glass there too look at that probably came that way from Brazil anyway we're waiting for the uh, owner for this to come by he'll probably be here in the next 30 minutes or so and in addition to that I've got this type 3 automatic transmission down here which somebody called me up about and wants it really bad so that might be on its way out of here too so it's gonna be a busy night tonight <laughs> and I'm exhausted I've been out here all day working on just everything you'll see some of it on video of course but let's take a break and we'll see what happens when these people get here all right, good end to a day he is out of here. Everything works brilliantly on this car. So happy with it. There's his dad's car, by the way. You can see them at our car show, both. Transmission is out and sold. So that's gone. Bus is still here, though. <laughs> here he comes with them halo lights on. And don't make fun of his clutch work. The clutch is adjusted properly now, and it hasn't been, so he's got to get used to it again. There they go. Another successful end to another Duckman video. Thanks, you guys, for watching. Licky, likey, comment, and subscribe. Don't forget to plug that dingle bell. You get updates every time that I upload a new video. Check out DuckShit.net for all of my different social media links. And we'll see you guys on the next go-around. Appreciate you watching.